Bill, you're here in Washington. NASA is your focus today. Proposed budget cuts. What's the deal? So uh, somebody in the administration wants to cut NASA budget 20% and cut NASA science budget almost 50%. 47%. You said someone. Are you not sure it's President Trump who wants to do that? Oh, I don't think. No, no. I don't. Seriously, everybody. I don't think it's the president. He, the first Trump administration was all in about space. Right. We're going to go to Mars. We're going to do these great things. You know, something's happened in the last few months where they've reversed course or worse than reversed course. And the implications of the 20 percent and nearly 50 percent cut to NASA science? Well, that the United States would cede leadership to other countries, especially China National Space Administration. Which so, is very competitive. Very competitive. Everybody, there's going to be what I'm calling another Sputnik moment or two. <clears throat> when China National Space puts Taikonauts on the moon in 2030, less than five years from now, mm -hmm. for reals, everybody, and then this whole business of sam sample return, bringing rocks back from Mars that may bear evidence of ancient life, uh, China National Space is going to launch in 2028 and bring them back in 2033. Meanwhile, the U.S., <laughs> so, you know, I, I just carry it. Here's a replica of the Mars sample Rock, rock sample tube, and everybody understand if we were to find evidence of life on another world, mm -hmm. it would change the course of human history. Right. So you say, well, how much does that cost? We're not sure. Never done it. Yeah. <laughs> and so that is. Uh, I'll just tell you, I worked on um, on uh, cameras on Mars as long ago as 1998. Back in the 20th century, <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, uh, there has been no love lost between uh, the Mars program and Office of Management and Budget. Mm -hmm. Right. Those guys have butted head and gals have butted head for over 20 years. But this is a whole nother, as and we say. If I understand you correctly, Bill, the question isn't how much it costs; it's how much is it worth. Woo! Yeah, yeah. It's priceless in a way, but. NASA also, objectively, every dollar that goes into NASA science comes back at least a factor of three uh, times. So if you put a dollar into NASA science, you're going to get three dollars back in the economy. And you're going to get practical things that already make our lives easier. And Global better. positioning, situational awareness, um, charge coupled of um, digital cameras, uh, mobile phones, uh, everything uh, is a result of of exploring the cosmos. And do you think the president, if reached on this, would change his mind or stop whatever's going on? Because as you said, and I documented it, many reporters did, Space Force and everything attended to that first term was literally rocket ships to the moon. Yeah. So Space Force, everybody, Space Force is military, but that job had to be done. By some way, somebody had to do this, the job the Space Force is doing. But we're talking about civilian space. Right. Yeah. So uh, this goes way back, exploration for exploration's sake. And uh, the Planetary Society, I'm the CEO, world's largest independent space interest organization. So one of the founders is Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. famous guy. Yep. Lou Friedman, who's an orbital mechanics guy at Jet Propulsion Lab, and Bruce Murray. Bruce Murray was the head of the Jet Propulsion Lab during the heyday of Voyager, that's still going with the golden record and Viking, the first landing on Mars. And famously, people would say to him, uh, why are you guys sending these spacecraft out there? What are you going to find? We don't know what we're going to find. That's why we're sending them. <laughs> right. And just understand just the NASA budget is a sliver of the pie. It's, it's barely the width of the pie cutter. It's less than 0.1% of the federal budget, and the return is extraordinary. So actuarially, Bill, I trend old, but my really? audience trends young. <laughs> so they may not know what you mean when you say a Sputnik moment. Yes, 1957. So uh, the Soviet Union put a spacecraft in orbit, an extraordinary thing, kind of a, uh, a physics thought experiment at first, but it turned out to be possible. And then... Uh, we all went outside here in Northwest Washington and watched this glowing light go overhead for a long time, uh, several years after that. And this changed the world. It changed the way 
uh, people felt about space because the, the, the phrase you'll hear is the ultimate high ground. If you have weapons in space, then you could uh, uh, exercise influence. Right. <clears throat> and in a sense, not changing the subject from NASA, but space is militarized in many ways. You know, global positioning systems or military gizmos, and everybody talks about intercontinental ballistic missiles. And, and space has a lot, a lot of spy satellites and so on. But <clears throat> we, we gather information and transmit information entirely in space. All the time. We rely on space assets. This broadcast is going someplace on satellite, right? And that's a result of both uh, military investment, but mainly, you guys, civil investment. Mm -hmm. Congress, as I understand it, is going to reject these budget cuts. It's inappropriation. Oh, bills. And that's the good thing. They're pushing back hard. But you got to get the bills passed. Yeah. So we want our thing today, we had over 300 people. 300 people came from all over the country. Uh, from 20 different, uh, mostly nonprofit science organizations, to uh, encourage Congress to put it over the finish line to sign the appropriations bills to reconcile them and sign them into law. It's a, it's, it's not really that wonky. Because it's the bottom line, respect. Congress on a bipartisan basis is not where the administration is. Absolutely not. Congress loves space, and you know, while we're talking politics. Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Texas, these are conservative venues, <laughs> uh, congressional districts, and they have a lot of space interest. And everybody's, this is the strange thing, where the previous Trump administration was so into space, and now they want to cut NASA in half. Let me broaden this conversation a little bit, Bill. You're the science guy. How would you say this administration writ large approach to science is different the second time around than the first time around? Uh, they're rejecting it in a way that is really almost hard to believe. Uh, I just, where to begin? You know, we're, we're here to talk about NASA. We're here to talk about NASA budget. But when I, I tell, say all the time, I went to Lafayette Elementary School mm -hmm. here in Washington, D.C. Right. A kid in my class had polio. Do not want polio. Put simply, polio bad. Right. <laughs> Vaccine good. And so this, what's going on right now, is really uh, ama amazing, uh, in a bad way. Potentially harmful. Potentially harmful. Yes. Uh, you don't want polio. You don't want any of these diseases that have been largely eliminated in the developed world because of vaccines. In this one case. And then the other extraordinary thing, we're here to talk about NASA. The other extraordinary thing is this refusal or unwillingness to accept the fact of climate change. It's just really puzzling for here, the most technically advanced society on Earth, to be having this uh, confusion about it is really amazing. And I want to follow up with you on that, Bill, because as you know, at the United Nations, the president recently gave a speech in which he said, and I quote, this climate change, it's the greatest con job ever perpetrated on the world, in my opinion. All these predictions, I'm still quoting the president, made by the United Nations and many others, often for bad reasons, were wrong. They were made by stupid people and have cost their countries fortunes and given those same countries no chance for success. If you don't get, I'm still quoting him here, if you don't get away from this green scam, your country's going to fail. I respectfully disagree. Walk, walk <laughs> me through your disagreements and what the president misunderstands about what climate change is and how it affects day-to-day -day living. So speaking of NASA, you can make a, uh, you can construct an argument that, that climate change on Earth in the last, in the modern era, the last 45 years, climate change on Earth was discovered by studying the climate of Venus. You can make that argument pretty strongly. V the Venusian atmosphere is 90% carbon dioxide, and it's it made the surface of Venus hot enough to melt fishing weights. Lead would just melt on the surface of Venus. And so we've put all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere the last two and a half centuries, and our world's getting warmer. And uh, by the way, uh, I was just, I'm not changing the subject. Mm -hmm. I was just in Alaska. Uh, I had a 
job there, and then I visited a guy, a buddy of mine from high school, and you can go to see glaciers. Mm -hmm. You can see in national parks where the glacier was in 1899, where it was in 1926, now in 2005, and then the glaciers now still, it's a mile and a half from 2005. In the next 20 years, but it's more like the next 10 years, the exit glacier will disappear. So tourism, uh, after oil and gas, tourism is Alaska's biggest uh, moneymaker or inca, so economy, a stimulation of the economy. And there's no glaciers to visit. That's going to change things in a bad way. And uh, uh, the world's changing, and it's because of human activity. And to say it's not is respectfully just incorrect. And it's creates more hazard, it seems to me, because we have more shocking climactic events more frequently. As predicted, consistent with every comp reasonable computer model that shows that the storms will get stronger, more frequent. They'll probably be bigger and sl more slow moving. And that's what's generally happening. Also from that speech, because it made a lot of news. Uh, oh, it President, did? Yeah. President said the United this. United Nations. Yeah, I have, I have a little standing order in the White House. Never use the word coal. Only use the words clean, beautiful coal. Sounds much better, doesn't it? <laughs> Does such a thing exist? Uh, well, not for us on my side of it. You just want to stop burning coal, everybody. And uh, understand why we have coal everywhere in the world. We're never going to run out of coal. It's because the world used to be warmer. The orbit of the Earth was doing this. And so there were wetlands everywhere on Earth, and they all got buried, and there's coal everywhere. The last 350 million years. So uh, we just can't burn coal anymore, all right? Just you, you shoot the messenger. It's not going to help you. I guess, uh, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Just it's not my fault that we can't burn coal anymore. And so uh, uh, we, the sooner we stop doing it, the better for everybody. And, you know, people talk about other nations are... Um, burning a lot of coal, but other nations are also producing solar panel and solar hot water systems at an extraordinary rate. And which, which leads us to green energy, and there's clearly a hostility within this administration to green energy, renewables, and the things that the president says are more expensive, less effective, and wasteful. Uh, be that as, as his belief may be, uh, there's more to it than just the kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour. There's more to it than just the price of every joule of, of, of horsepower hour of, of energy. It's, it's climate's changing. We, we have to stop producing fossil fuels. And so I uh, stop burning fossil fuels, I mean. And yes, I love flying on planes. I'm kooky for kerosene, jet fuel, yes. I love rockets, rocket jet fuel, rocket fuel, all good. We have to find new ways to accomplish these things. And we will if we just get to work, you know. And I'm very excited. I'm not joking, you guys. I'm very excited about fusion mm -hmm. energy. Why? Because it could change the world. <laughs> and everybody's running around these days going on and on about artificial intelligence, AI. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm an actor. I'm in two unions. I may be out of a job. I'll all be artificial, right. be robot right. bill or digital bill. But that, that aside, the practical application of artificial intelligence may very well be in the controlling of the magnetic fields needed to produce fusion energy. So fusion energy goes back when I took physics the first time, 40 years. It's always 40 years in the future. So everybody, this is not fission energy. This is taking protons, for example, smashing them together, creating, uh, overcoming the force that repels them, and it's called um, strong atomic force, producing helium nuclei, hydrogen, for example. The problem has been containing it in a magnetic field, and I'm not joking, just like on Star Trek. Magnetic field for antimatter, same deal. Well, it may be that artificial intelligence systems will enable us, or skilled people, to get the magnetic field to not only react to where this plasma is going. So everybody, solid liquid gas, the, the fourth state of matter is plasma. This is where all the electrons are completely dissociated from their 
nuclei, atom, atomic nuclei, and they're like doing their thing. And it may be, uh, the, the, the expression is uh, controlling a plasma is like, like trying to control jello with chopsticks. Right. You, you can sort of, but it may be that artificial intelligence system could anticipate where the magnetic field is needed, and that would change the world. Could it would change itself. the world about the, the adaptation to that plasma movement and therefore harness it as a source of energy. A source of heat and light, yeah. Source heat, of heat and heat, light. Heat, 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 and you heat up And so walk my audience through what water. that solves. Say again? Walk my audience through what that solves. Well, so then you'd have all this hot heat, all this heat, and you'd boil water the way we normally do. You'd spin a turbine, a fan mm -hmm. going backwards right. with steam, and uh, move a... Uh, coil of wire through a magnetic field, a magnetic field through a coil of wire, and make electricity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just hearken all the time. All four of my grandparents were born in the 1800s. They didn't know there was fusion. They didn't know there were neutrons. They didn't know there was relativity. And now your mobile phone depends on both special and general relativity. And so who knows what the next 30 years are going to bring to us, but the possibilities are remarkable. I'm excited. And that brings us back to federal support for research. Yes. So this is, you guys, the Department of Energy here in the United States created, for the first time, they got more energy out than they put in with a fusion experiment. And a few, I guess they've done it a half dozen times now. Uh, that changed the world. It changed the, what, the way researchers thought, thought about what was possible. And that's government investment, you guys. It's not, um, it's not all commercial. And just talking briefly about commercial space. We we're here for NASA. Did I mentioned NASA. So <clears throat> commercial space is very important. They have lowered the cost of getting to low Earth orbit. Everybody said to, do you, you heard of Elon Musk? I think I have, yeah. yes. So I saw just, one or two stories. About yeah, that. yeah. Just note well, he used to be on the board of the planetary side. I gave him a ride to the airport in ancient times. It was a different deal. But he said to everybody in the community, if I can use that term, how do we, I want to go to Mars. How do I get to Mars? How do I get to, and people told him, knowledgeable people said, you got to lower the cost of getting to low Earth orbit, because mm -hmm. this is this is rocket science, you guys. But it's easy to understand. It's very difficult to build a rocket big enough to go all the way to Mars. Right. Instead, you go in orbit, refuel it in orbit, build a bigger rocket, and then take that rocket right. to Mars. All right. So, but be that as it may. So he embraced an old idea, which is also not intuitive, maybe, but reasonable. The cheapest part of the rocket is fuel. If we just add more fuel, then we could reuse these things. And he's right. I was right. So that's what they're doing. That's good. That's great. That's cool. But that's not what NASA science does. That's, that's the truck to take the, the instruments to where you want them to go. And the scientists with the instruments. The science is, so I say all the time, there is no business case for studying dark energy, which seems to be mo affecting the motions of our galaxy. There's not... Nobody's getting rich exploring for uh, extraterrestrial life on other worlds. That's not where you make your money, people. Right. And so uh, these discoveries that we make in the cosmos change the world in the best way. And it is a very reasonable use of our intellect and treasure. Bill and I, what a pleasure. Is that it? That's it. I can go on. I know you can. Did I mention the Planetary <laughs> Society? Check us out at planetary.org. Uh, the world's largest uh, independent space organization advancing the scientific exploration of space so that humans everywhere will know the cosmos and our place within it. Elevator door closes. Thanks, you guys.